Dennis has a PhD from Berkeley in insect pathology, microbial, microbial control of insects pests. He has an MA in humanistic psychology from Sonoma State and is a graduate of the C.G. Jung Institute, Zurich. He is the author of the four volumes of the Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe, Jung, Hermes, and Ecopsychology. He began studying and using the I Ching in 1975, and his 1983 Jung Institute thesis was titled Synchronicity Experiments with the I Ching and Their Relevance, Relevance to the Theory of Evolution. His published article, Use of the I Ching in the Analytic Setting, has been translated into Chinese and the lecture Hexagrams from the I Ching Appearing in the Dreams of a Western Man is available through the Chicago Jung Institute, ecoyung.com and jungianecopsychology.com. And with that, I turn it over to Dennis. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Excellent, good to see you again, Judy. A little bit warmer out there in California than we've been suffering through here in the Midwest. So uh, I'll start my uh, screen share right away. And there we go. We've all become kind of proficient in uh, Zooming uh, recently. So uh, I met uh, Judy a few years ago. And uh, we were talking about uh, me growing up in uh, Southern California. I lived in Anaheim for six years of my life. And I remember going down to the beach with my parents. They'd have these party on, parties on the beach and they would go grunion hunting when the grunion run, run was in. Now all these millions of fish would come up on shore. I think it's like twice a year during the summer months only in Southern California and the Baja Peninsula. And I remember those little fish kind of spinning around on the surface of the sand and half burying themselves in the sand. And when I was talking to Judy about that, she said, well, here's a picture of just how many there are. She said, oh, we have a local weekly newspaper called the Grunion Gazette. So there's the Grunion uh, little drawing of it between the words Grunion and Gazette. So uh, as a Jungian, I think of a uh, little Canuncio there and think of Jung's writings, a lot of writings about Christianity and the fish imagery. And of course, then Jung feeling that he was a fish during one of his near-death experiences. So I uh, spent the first six years of my life in Anaheim and then my parents moved to my mom's home farm in uh, Kewanee County, Wisconsin. That's east of Green Bay. There's a nice aerial view that all the farmers had. And I formed a deep connection with the animals, the cows, the pigs, and the chickens. But even more importantly, I spent a lot of time wandering with my faithful dog, Rusty, on the woods, in the woods and the river area. That's on the top left part of your screen. That's where I had all my 4-H club uh, collections of uh, trees, tree samples, wildflowers, studied songbirds. The last thing I took was insects. And by the eighth grade, I decided I wanted to be an entomologist. So in the fall of 1967, I went out to Berkeley to start my PhD work in insect pathology, microbial control of insects so you don't have to use chemical pesticides. There's a picture of me probably about 1967 my, or 68. My hair was a little longer then. So my first full year in Berkeley was 1968, if you remember what that was like. And it uh, transformed my life by being there. And all I'll say is I didn't miss much. I eventually got my PhD thesis uh, factors influencing the susceptibility of the beet armyworm, Spadoptera exigua, a Huebner to a nuclear polyhedrosis virus. So I'd become a world authority on a secondary pest of cotton in the Central Valley. So my broad interest in nature had been reduced to this. 
So as a result of being in Berkeley in the late 60s, I kept her hearing Jung's name come up and I thought, who in the heck is this guy? And finally in 1973, I started reading my first Jung and I was so taken by Jung, I thought, where has this guy been all my life? I couldn't believe I'd been through two of the best universities in America and never heard of Jung. But I was so taken by him within nine months, even though I never thought of being a therapist, I was applying to train at the Jung Institute in Zurich. And before going there, I got, I secretly was enrolled at Sonoma State uh, to work on a master's degree in humanistic psychology. And my creative uh, thesis was metaphors and symbols in popular music and the I Ching. So what had happened was when I started reading Jung, this, these words the I Ching kept coming up and I thought, what the heck is that about? So this is so Berkeley and so Unitarian. In 1975, the first Unitarian Society in Berkeley had a week long series of events to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Jung's birth. And the last event they had was given by a Presbyterian minister who was working with the street people in Berkeley. And one of the things he did was he would pull out his yarrow stalks and help uh, them generate a hexagram. So he showed us how to use the yarrow stalk method for consulting the Yi Jing. And I had a countercultural friend, I'll say, uh, who sold yarrow stalks. I bought some, so I have never used coins to consult the Jing. Now, this is uh, Jung's favorite picture of himself. Jung was very connected with nature. And I didn't realize until I was finishing writing my Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe that one of the big attractions I had to Jung was just how uh, ecological his whole conceptual system was, is, and how that emerged out of his deep connection with nature. So a bit about Jung then. He, uh, he had, after his split with Freud, which was complete by 1913, he sort of went off the deep end. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he called it the confrontation with the unconscious. And he was in that very deep realm, the realm of shamans and madmen, until uh, the beginning of the end of World War I. And he said that uh, he gradually began to emerge from the darkness of his confrontation with the unconscious about 1918 or 1919, when he began to make circular drawings every morning, and they reflected his inner psychological state and his, the transformation of his psyche. And he came to realize that this was a mandala and it reflected the wholeness of his personality that could tolerate no self-deceptions. And that became Jung's, one of his main ideas, the idea of the self, a centering and cent a center and centering element in the psyche and the path to individuation. Then in 1928, he painted this picture. It was a mandala with a golden uh, castle in the center. And he thought to himself, this looks very Chinese. Then he described what happened next as a synchronicity. Uh, a shortly after that painting, he got a letter from Richard Wilhelm who enclosed a manuscript entitled The Secret of the Golden Flower. It was a Taoist alchemical treatise. And that had a request for Jung to write a commentary on it. So the text was about the yellow castle, the germ of the immortal body. And Jung said, it gave me confirmation that the ideas uh, about the ideas he had about the self and the mandala. Quote, he said, that was the first event which broke through my isolation. So he had all these powerful and rather strange experiences. But then when he saw this text on the secret of the golden flower, that's when he began to realize, oh, this is in the archetypal domain. This is something that people around the world from the beginning of our species have experienced. 
Uh, and then he also realized that alchemy was one of the basic links between the East and the West, just like mysticism that goes to the depths of the psyche, the psyche which I'll talk about later on, uh, links all cultures together. So Jung then formed a deep friendship with uh, Richard Wilhelm. There's my copy of The Secret of the Golden Flower. There's Richard Wilhelm. And he was later asked by Carrie Baines, who translated Wilhelm's translation of the Chinese Book of Wisdom, the I Ching. Wilhelm translated in the German, and then Carrie Baines translated in the English. Jung wrote this profound forward to the book, and if you haven't read it, highly recommend it. So let's have a brief look at the history of the I Ching. It is one of the most profound books of wisdom on the planet, and I'll develop the reasons for that in a minute. So this book goes back 5,000 years, goes back to Chinese shamanism and the beginning of the Chinese ideograms, their, their language. The shamans would, uh, when they had an issue for themselves or their tribe, they would scratch some images on a bone, uh, which would be a tortoise shell, or an animal bone, they would stick those bones into a fire, then they would divinate from the cracks. So there is the legendary first emperor of China, Fu Si, goes back about 3000 BCE. And the legend is he was sitting beside the Yellow River and a tortoise or a yellow dragon crawled up out of the river and had the eight trigrams on its back. And Fusi interpreted that as the meanings of the interrelationship between heaven and earth. So during the Shang dynasty, which goes back from 1600 to 1045 BC, they used ox bones and tortoise shells to divinate. And the bone writings on there, there you see some of the writings. That's the prototypical Chinese language. There's a tortoise shell. And here are some of the images from those uh, shells. So the top uh, line, that's from the Xiang Bronze Age a script. The line below that is from the Oracle Bone script. And the third line from the top are the regular modern day Chinese script. And then it's repeated in that sequence in the next line below. So then King Wen was imprisoned by the Shang dynasty for seven years. And it's one of those situations where one is withdrawn from the society, can go deep within, vision quest, um, kind of sudden visionary experiences, deep meditation, near-death experiences. These are all things that put us deep into that realm. And while he was in prison for those number of years, he doubled the trigram that's uh, uh, three, a combination of three solid, which are yang, uh, and or a broken yin lines. Double the trigrams to create hexagram six, and then provided some commentary on those hexagrams. He used a lot of information that had been verbal until that point. And he wrote some ethical notes about the commentary on all the lines. Then his son, the Duke of Zhou, codified the writings from his father. And then Confucius, who lived from 551 to 479 BC, edited the book. He was um, about the 10th or 12th editor of the I Ching. And he made a comment that he, if he had 50 years to live, he would spend it studying the I Ching. So Confucius saw it as one of the five classics. Jing means book or classic, and Yi means change. So it's the Yi Jing is the book of changes. And Confucius added, when you work with Wilhelm, one of the classic trans, uh, translations, it's the judgment under the judgment. It's a Machiavellian influence, uh, counseling the emperors when they send the armies, marching how to govern, and so on. Then during the, uh, since the Han, Han Dynasty, which was 206 BC to 220 AD, 
every major Chinese thinker, writer, philosopher has been influenced by this profound book. Sometime in there, I'm not sure when, and Wilhelm, it comes under the image, the Chinese went back to the two trigrams that composed the hexagrams and made some commentary about that relationship. So that's the Chinese history. Let's fast forward to Leibniz, Leibniz, a German philosopher and mathematician. In 1689, he uh, published his uh, discovery of the binary code, a system of zeros and ones, of true and false. He had worked on that for about seven or nine years. Then he was totally bummed out when he realized the Chinese had scooped him by about 2,000 years because one of the arrangements of the hexagrams, the Fu C arrangement, is a binary code. So the basis of the I Ching is a numerical system. And Jung called numbers the most abstract uh, form of the archetypes. So one of the reasons I think that Jing is such a profound book is that it uh, still, the language, Chinese language has the picture words. And here is the ideogram, the picture word, if you will, for the sage. And if you put the different elements together, one way of describing what's in there is the ear listening to the inner king. So on the bottom, that line with a cross on it, that is a symbol for kind of a warrior chief. I think of somebody like uh, King David in the Bible or Crazy Horse for the Native Americans, look, the uh, Lakota Sioux. So, uh, Crazy Horse was an incredible shaman and a great warrior. And if you extend the top of that cross to the line above it, which really it should be, that's like a crown on one of these warrior chieftains. That's the inner king. So the, the image to me is what Jungian psychology is about. It's the process and the goal of Jungian psychology, the ego relationship to the self and the unconscious. Here's another image. It's the Tao, and it would, you could translate it as the head that walks. So what you are trying to do in Taoism, you are trying to consciously walk in accord with the what is constellated at the moment to be fully involved, engaged in the present moment in your life, to fully embody that moment. I think one of the other reasons the Jing is so powerful is that the number and the sequence of the hexagram based on this binary code offers a very uh, systematic base for the Jing. It was also formulized and sim uh, simplified how to uh, consult it. So when I do my I Ching workshops, I don't have to show people how to interpret the cracks you know, from a bone. I can show them the counting method for consulting the Jing with the Arlstock method. And then I think intuition and also experimentation. When the sages got these answers for the emperors who they were mainly counseling, they would see what eventually happened with their advice. So these are some of the reasons why I think the Jing is, is as great a book as it is. So here's a comment from Wilhelm. The book of changes contains a measure of heaven and earth. Therefore, it enables us to comprehend the Tao of heaven and earth and its order, quote, if we ask how the book of changes can be a reproduction of the cosmos, the answer is that it was the work of men with cosmic intelligence, men who have incorporated their wisdom in the symbols of this book. Hence, it contains the standard of heaven and earth. So I'm gonna do a deep dive with this group um, because it's recorded. I decided I could put a lot of uh, complex material out. I don't expect everybody to understand everything I say at first glance, but uh, absorb as much as you can. And because it's recorded, you can go back and uh, look at it again later on. 
So this is the, um, the ideogram for change. And it says that it's a, a Chinese, old Chinese symbol of a lizard or a chameleon, or perhaps even an early symbol of the sun placed over the moon. So that's what the, the image for change, the sun over the moon or a chameleon or a lizard. So a lizard doesn't move in a straight line. So here we're getting away from linearity. This is one of my favorite books on the Jing. I can highly recommend it. If you wanna have some sense of what the Tao is, this is a David Hinton's translation of uh, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. So close your eyes and I will read to you what I have come across as the best description of the Tao, the deepest level. So with your eyes closed then, Lao Tzu speaks of emptiness, silence, and dark enigma for the realm of unknowing whose, unsential, whose essential nature of non-being precedes the differentiation of the thousand things and of language itself. Tao is simply a word for the unknowable and unnameable. Thoughts are from the same generative source as the 10,000 things and share its ontological structure. Being and non-being are one and the same before they arise and give birth to each other. Practicing meditation allows you to experience the depths of consciousness as thought burgeons forth from the emptiness and disappears back into it or you can simply dwell in that undifferentiated emptiness, that generative realm of non-being. One can re-inhabit the primal universe in the most profound way, where the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity dissolves. Consciousness and natural processes are of a single tissue. This restores the modern human consciousness to natural processes and the ancient undifferentiated levels of human culture. So you can open your eyes now. Like I said, you can uh, see all of this um, uh, later with the recording. So the basic element of the Jing is depicted by a solid and a broken line. That's pretty abstract, yin and yang. If you want to, you can close your eyes again, and I'll go through these descriptions of yin and yang. So yin and yang, negative, positive, passive, active, female, male, receptive, creative, dark, light, night, day, cold, heat, soft, hard, wet, dry. Winter, summer, shadow, sun. Okay, if you have your eyes closed, you can open them then. Now we're gonna take a deep dive here. So from that supreme ultimate, uh, the dark enigma, I call it the pregnant, pregnant void, the first thing to emerge from that, and I'll talk about how I think that is related to Hermes from our Western culture, is the yin yang symbol. And then we have, you see then the, uh, uh, yang and yin lines and so on. So this is an illustration then of how the eight trigrams emerge from the supreme ultimate, the absolute. The so two uh, lines represent the duality in nature, yin and yang, heaven and earth. Then the middle roll shows the four ways that heaven and earth come together, forming the four seasons. So when you're Doing the Arrowstock method and you're putting down four sticks at a time, that represents these four lines uh, better translated than Wilhelm's supreme success, uh, furthering and perseverance as spring, growth, harvest, and trial. The bottom roll, the third line, represents man as a synthesis of heaven and earth, thus creating the eight uh, elemental trigrams. And that are, these are to represent the cosmic, all the cosmic and physical conditions on earth. The attributes in the book of changes then, for example, 
in Chen, the bottom line, far left corner, is heaven, firmness, creativity, strength, force, power. Next trigram, lake, joy, openness, pleasure, satisfaction, excess, and so on. So here's uh, how uh, one of the illustrations of the creative and the receptive energies emerging, uh, emerging the 10,000 things. And this is from the Northern Sun Dynasty and it's an illustration of the diagram of change. Shows the action of the Tao and the dynamic interaction of the microcosm and the macrocosm. Still pretty abstract. Uh, this is the cover of the 1974 Scientific American. And there you see the yin yang symbol in the middle, surrounded by the eight trigrams. This is a more elaborate description. So then those eight trigrams is what King Wen doubled. You can see the uh, second layer out from the yin yang symbol, uh, the, the, another layer of trigrams on top of the eight to produce the outermost circle the 64 hexagrams in the Yi Ching. This is an abstraction of it, that bottom white line. I associate that with the yin yang symbol. And then the, uh, the, the yin would be the next level above that, that first solid black line would be the yin, and then the yang to the right, and then we go to the four and the eight and eventually up to the 64 hexagrams on the top. And here is the Fu C arrangement of the hexagrams. That's the binary code depicted as solid and broken lines. And remember, all the computers run on the binary code. So somehow or another, these Chinese sages tap into the binary code and to look at the next level, we'll come back to the West. Uh, this is my favorite Greek god, Hermes. It's my volume three of the Dairy Farmer's Guide, Hermes, Eco-Psychology and Complexity Theory. I see Hermes as a god of complexity theory. So this is my summary of Hermes in relationship to the Jing. The secret of Hermes identity is in the gap in the wand representing the transitional and transactional activities that can be visualized as a dance of the Northern light. So uh, here is a drawing from my book on Hermes. Uh, on A is the original, one of the original staffs of Hermes. It was two snakes wound around a staff. And that of course is the genesis of the, the uh, Caduceus that the medical doctors use, that got reduced to the abstraction of figure eight with the gap at the top. And then C, I emphasize that Hermes secret is about what you don't see. It's the gap at the top of the figure eight. So Hermes is the God of the exchanges and the transitional phenomena. In the diagram uh, of the trigram generation, and the, the yin yang is a symbol of the first emergence from the dark enigma. And we have to remember that for Jungians, a symbol is composed of a mysterious aspect in conjunction with something that is recognizable and definable. To me, that's like the bubbles in a cloud chamber. They point to some kind of underlying generating force of those bubbles. So Hermes was the first masculine yang energy to be called forth from the great mother. And Hermes is the only God that can enter and return from the source, the unconscious, the realm of the dead. As such, Hermes has access and brings consciousness to the vegetative and animal realms and is associated with the psychoid synchronicity, which are a causal and they're outside of space and time, that would be the dark enigma and the unus mundus, the one world that the alchemist talked about. So the Yi Jing, as I see it, 
offers moral guidelines to channel Hermes energy into healthy, holistic, individuating directions by addressing and balancing out the excesses of yin and yang energy in any given situation. And my Im image for that, my metaphor, is Jung responding to a woman who had written to him and, and asking about the unconscious. And Jung said, you talk about the unconscious like it's some kind of a paternal father figure. And Jung was a big sailor, and he suggested that the image would be on a sailboat out in the ocean, that it, that would be like the ego in relationship to the unconscious. So in life, you want to follow a path with heart and meeting that would come from the ear listening to the inner king, listening to your dreams, analysis, meditation, that sort of stuff. And you have some goals, you have some sense of how you manifest that meaning in your life. But that changes by the inner and outer dimension of the unconscious and the, the natural world, if you will. So when you're sailing, you're, you're having to relate to the winds and the tides and the movement of the water and adjust accordingly. But your idea then is to manifest something. Jung saw humans as co-creating with God. We are the conscious elements of God's creation. We anchor God, manifest God in space and time. And every one of us are, have some unique way that we have to manifest and incorporate that energy, if you're putting it into Western terms. So here's um, another way I presented this in my volume three. Start off with A there, a symbol for the male rather appropriately. So out of this uh, original wholeness, something comes out, um, if something emerges. So B then, if something emerges and becomes conscious, there's, there's a part of it that doesn't fully come into consciousness. And you'll see this in dreams when thing is about to come conscious, there's often a two-ness. So something becomes conscious, something is uh, kind of complementing it in the unconscious and then C, you develop, uh, I'll use the, uh, as a male, I'll use the uh, masculinity here. You develop your masculine energy to the fullness, and then you begin to develop, or hopefully you're developing all along, your inner sense, the inner feminine, your complementary as a human being, namely a female. And that to me is, uh, um, related to the yin-yang symbol, and then I broke the yin-yang symbol apart. And the essence of the jing and the beauty of that symbol is that within the heart of the yang, the, the white arm, if you will, is the heart, is the, is the essence or the link to the yin. And in the heart of the yin is the yang. So that to me symbolically illustrates the emergence from some original wholeness. Now, this is as deep a dive as we're going to go, so hang on. So I tried to summarize all of this. So there's Hermes wand in the middle, and one side, one arm can be yin, and the other side can be yang. So the three and the four, the three is uh, 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 the circle, is the first hexagram, and the jing is a circle. And the second hexagram, hexagram two, is the square. Uh, and then the threes and the fours, these are threes and the fours, I'll go. So male, female. And in the Jing, the hexagram one is about the inspiration. And then hexagram two is to take that inspiration and manifest it. It's like uh, God and Sophia in the Old Testament and Shiva and Shakti in Hinduism. And Edison said that uh, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So that's hexagram one and two. And in alchemy, you're trying to square the circle. The circle is the wholeness and the inspiration. Squaring it is that 99% perspiration, that 10,000 hours to manifest something in space and time. So again, continuing the complementarity, sperm and egg, energy, form, wave, particle, 
spirit, matter, psyche, soma, image, word, process, form, life, death, Hermes, Apollo. And at the bottom, I have the three in the forest, one of the big enigmas uh, in uh, depth psychology and in physics as well. And it's, it's really a, a going back and forth. I think of Winnicott talking about the, you can't separate the, the infant from the mother. This is a holistic ecological way of looking at things. There are things don't exist in isolation. And what is tricky is uh, I don't know whether to put consciousness in the unconscious uh, in, as a three or a four or human or God. I think they can go either way. Humans are to consciously embody the energies from God. The best description I saw of Jung trying to explain the connection between something like matter and spirit were two trigrams pointing toward each other. So you can take those, you can take those threes and fours listed above, but let's take spirit and matter. Matter on the bottom, spirit on top. And Jung said that those trigrams would get in infinitesimally close, but they wouldn't touch. And it's synchronicity that links the two together. Then at the very bottom is, I misspelled prophetisa, uh, the, the Maria prophetisa, the Coptic. Out of the one comes the two, out of the two comes the three, and out of the three comes the one is the four. So out of the original wholeness, the one, comes a duality. That's what I showed when, uh, with the uh, genesis of Hermes one, a duality. And then three is like a, when you become conscious of a duality or you're conscious that you, you have a complex and you're living out one side or the other, the conscious side or your shadow side, for example, but you're stuck in it. How do you get beyond that? You have to go down to the original wholeness back to the one and out of that, from what Jung called a transcendent function comes the four. So out of the one comes the two, two comes the three and out of three comes the one as the four. And what the Jing is trying to do is to, to tell you at a very deep level, kind of at that three point, just where you are out of balance and how you can rebalance and then move toward the four state. And this is the alchemical dictum. Um, I put it up there. It's, uh, you can read that later on, but it's another way of describing those four states. The, when you consult the Jing, what you are doing, you're using some random process to know which uh, of the answers to read. There's 64 hexagrams, six lines per hexagram. Each line has four possibilities. Uh, so you have a total of 4,096 possible answers. They're all archetypal. And Jung got together with the great nuclear physicist, Wolfgang Pauli, and they decided that synchronicity had to be added to our construct of the universe of indestructible energy, space-time continuum, and the constant connection through effect, causality. So this great nuclear physicist together with Jung thought that synchronicity had to be part of our worldview to have a complete worldview. So that's uh, some of the more abstract elements. So we'll go to the next level what to put images to what I've just been talking about. Here's one of my favorite books to illustrate that called Mandala, published in 72 by Jose and Miriam Aguales. And this is my favorite image to illustrate um, the 10,000 things. So at the very bottom is a, a person meditating. And I see that first circle as an imaginal presentation of the dark enigma, the silence, the pregnant void. That next big circle is how 
that then manifests in space and time, starting at the most abstract. You look at the center of that circle and everything coming out of that circle, emerging from that, if you will, you will see a yin yang symbol. Let me see if I have, oops, um, a yin yang symbol. So what we have here is called Dion White's The Mandala of Evolution. And uh, my connection with this is my last year of training in Zurich, I was sitting at a train station looking at somebody's hexagrams and my head almost exploded. I never had an experience like this before or since, but I had just had this overwhelming uh, sense, kind of conviction that there's a connection between the I Ching uh, and synchronicity and the theory of evolution. And for 10 days, all of these, a lot of ideas just kept pouring out and I developed a synchronicity experiment. And I realized that it could, it could be possible to statistically prove there was something beyond causality. And when I realized my experiment, difficult as it would be to conduct, could possibly work, I was shaken. It, it felt like the ground was falling out from under me. And that's when I realized that science and causality is very comforting that you can explain everything that there is. So uh, here's the genetic code. And what do you know? It's composed of 64 code words, just like the 64 hexagrams. The code, the, the code words for the amino acids are triplicates, just like the trigrams. So each of the uh, uh, there are two basic types of nucleotides, the purines and the pyrimidines, like yin and yang. And each of those has uh, one of the, those chemicals are more likely to break down than the other. So you can put that into yin and yang concept. So what you have then are those combinations of the, uh, the 64 code words. And this is very brief. Some of you will be very familiar with this, other you of you might have forgotten this from your college days, but there's this uh, DNA helix uh, composed of those code words, adenine, guanine, cyte, cy, um, uh, cysteine, and C A G T C, adenine, guanine, cyan, thymine, and cysteine. Uh, so then in the triplicates for the code words, so when a protein is going to be manufactured, the DNA helix splits and, and RNA comes in to copy part of the DNA. It's kind of a complementary copy, but instead of uh, thymine, it has uracil. Then the RNA goes out into the cell and then you have transfer RNAs that one end of this, that protein has the matching code for what's on the RNA and the other end goes out and can collects the appropriate amino acid for that code. Then it, the transfer in RNA brings it back to the transcript RNA, lines them up, then all those amino acids lined up together are zipped together, and that's what forms the proteins. The proteins are the enzymes of life. They create everything that we have. So that's how you go from the abstract of number and chemical to a protein and to life. Now, if we look at this, um, this uh, image of life, there's that meditator on the bottom, the original wholeness. And then in the center, you see the yin yang symbol then the four and then the eight star, and then that little thread around it, that's a DNA strand. Then out of the DNA toward the bottom, notice more toward the light and the moon and the water, would be the first life forms on life, the single cells. And that would be bacteria. So the earth is about 4.5 billion years old, a billion years after the Earth existed, the first uh, single cells emerged. 
And then it took another half billion years before multicellular forms emerged. So the bacteria then are, are those single cells. And so look at the center. Again, this is how the 10,000 forms emerge from this basic archetypal structure. There it is again, the yin-yang, and then the, the uh, yin-yang symbol, the yin and yang, um, the, the fourness and the eight. And my premise is that, and here's what it looks like inside of a cell. This is one of the latest images of what happens inside of a cell. So my premise then is that um, the, that symbol is um, the yin yang symbol is not the symbol of the supreme ultimate. Hermes is the one that brings something forth from the unconscious, from the beyond. So he is at that transition, just like he's a transition between life and death and the seasons and everything else. But at one level, it's the transition between the unknowable and the beginning to be known in the most abstract form. And then his relationship to Apollo, Apollo puts that more into words and equations and abstractions. But that first manifestation in the symbolic realm and the meaning of the symbol that I talked about before is the yin yang symbol. Back to our image. So to the left of that abstraction, we see the invertebrates um, and the, the early multicellular forms of life on the right. But look what how the artist portrayed it at the top, that, that uh, eight branches of that star, which would represent those eight trigrams is split. And, I, and then you see the more uh, complex forms of life, dinosaurs in there and the trees and everything. But notice at the very top, kind of straight up from the center, there's Adam and Eve, a man and a woman. And this is what is so important for our species to realize. We have to realize how unique we are because of our consciousness and our hands and being able to walk upright and manipulate nature we are the only species that have consciously been able to figure out kind of the laws of the universe and bend all those laws for our effect. So in a sense, we have the wisdom of the gods, but the challenge is we, do, we, we have the knowledge of the gods, but we do not have the wisdom. And that's a supreme challenge of our species because we have demonstrated, we demonstrate to this minute how brutal and mean were torture uh, and, and punishment and dictatorships and everything, and how mean we can be to each other in racism, think George Floyd and that sort of thing. Uh, so how do we channel that energy into life supporting uh, other human supporting forms, but also our relationship with the planet? We have to change that relationship. Now, the way I put this together, that that's the Garden of Eden experience. So when we became conscious in the garden from that serpent, from that knowledge of everything that's depicted below uh, that the uh, Adam and Eve, if you will, the consciousness of that realm then is something that we have to learn how to use intelligently. And the way I imagine it is, um, that we have to move toward what Jung call a new age, the age of Aquarius, a paradigm shift. He saw in 1940, there had to be a paradigm shift. And that's what he labeled it. Uh, I think of the writings of Tyar de Chardin, where he talked about the omega point in the new sphere. So we have humans all over the planet, this very evolved form of life. And these, we have to come together in some unified way with all of our diversity. And he called that the Omega point. And there again is another image for it. So this is how uh, the 10,000 forms would, this is how the evolution of life would look as one of the 10,000 forms. But because this is archetypal and abstract and archetypes, these are the archetypes for the universe. So whether 
Um, I had an analysand years ago who uh, uh, in his, I think, fourth round of analysis had a sabbatical from the university. So I was really able to focus and get deeply into his work. He wanted to work on the anima and he had this amazing series of dreams. And six times during that, that uh, analysis, uh, hexagrams were involved. Twice uh, he was given a hexagram in his dreams at crucial points. And then when he was awake, he intuited what the changing lines were. I'll talk about that later. Twice um, he um, saw, twice he was told to consult the Jing. And then twice he remembered the fall of the coins being flipped by his anima figure in the dream. So to me, it shows just how universal this genetic code is. I mean, this uh, binary code is that's at the core of the Yi Jing, the most abstract form of the archetypes. It applies to East and West. It applies to the dream world. But in that, uh, that uh, mandala there in the middle, it could be about the seasons. And I have a video that I can link you to later on called Seasons of the Soul. I tried to demonstrate here in the Midwest in with our landscape and our seasons, what those four elements of the Jing are, spring, growth, harvest, and trial. But you could also put geology and geological evolution in there. This is another imaginal way of presenting what that previous mandala was. This is a Taoist robe. And I got this off of the cover of the Taoist Yi Jing. So notice at the bottom of the road, there are your hexagrams, very abstract. Then you have dragons with uh, four of the trigrams, but then look above. What's going on here? Well, I think we look a little closer. Uh, I, you see it's kind of emerging out of the water. I think that's like the previous mandala we were looking at when there was water at the bottom of this big um, mandala in the center. But what I think we have here is, let me see if we can get it even closer. Yeah. Um, you notice that circle with a blue and white and kind of a, a swan. I imagine that as the the uh, origin of the pregnant void, the dark enigma that, uh, that uh, Lao Tzu talked about. And then the figure behind it, that dragon is holding up the yin yang symbol. I think of that dragon as Hermes, as Hermes is what calls forth the first to think to emerge from the pregnant void. And there's the yin yang symbol. So Hermes is a genesis of the gods and goddesses. And this is most abstract. And you notice there are four dragon heads around that and how shimmering it is. That early this image of the how the Tao manifests into the 10,000 forms. So this to me is an imaginal way of presenting that uh, those diagrams of the uh, the trigrams that I was showing before and how those, well, that's too far back. Yep, there it is right there. So let's then look at, move toward the Yi Jing and how we consult the Jing. And you can read this, but basically uh, one of the most succinct summaries I saw of this, this is not in my article on using the Yi Jing in the analytic setting. Uh, this is the part that's left out, so this complements it. So uh, Wang Fu Qi um, lived from 1619, 1692. Hypothesized that there was an imperceptible, all embracing psychophysical continuum that similar to Jung's idea of the psychoid archetype in Unus Mundus. And in that continuum, it included numbers, those abstract forms of the archetypes. And then when you use the Yi Jing, uh, you generate numbers. So that is an, 
uh, the entree into this those that realm, and it will tell you what uh, your present situation is. So the different aspects that emerge from the unity of all existence comes forward in certain typical phases or processes of change. And these phases can be indicated by number. So what you have with the I Ching is not a dog, but um, what you have with the Jing is the ability to uh, know what the kind of the zeitgeist of the moment is with regard to the particular issue that you are addressing the I Ching. So uh, the one way I think about it is uh, that like time has a quality. And for those of you familiar with astrology, astrology talks about the kind of the quality of time in terms of what uh, where Aquarius is in regard to Sagittarius and what house is it. That's a, trying to describe the quality of the moment. And um, the Yi Jing is my symbol system. I think it's a lot easier to get a sense of the quality of a moment by tossing coins or using the arrow stalks than learning this complex system of astrology, but they're both aimed at the same thing. Um, as a scientist, I have a little more faith in, in uh, understanding or, or uh, trust, if you will, in how the Jing works scientifically. I, can't quite wrap my mind totally around astrology of uh, stars influencing my total life, but there are people that have. So synchronicity, to me, the best description, a lot easier description of synchronicity as a fact than my Zurich thesis is in this book's dogs that know when their owners are coming home. And on pages, on the 50 pages, pages 50 to 60 in that book, is an incredible description of an experiment with a dog that to me is proven beyond statistics. He provides the statistics that prove that synchronicity exists. And basically, here's the experiment. Uh, this woman had a dog that seemed to know when she was coming home. So they set up a camcorder recording the window box where the dog would go to sit when she was coming home, recording that 20, 24 seven. Um, the, when the woman was at work, a random number generator would determine when to place a call telling the woman to go home, at which time she would take public transportation because you would think the dog would hear her car coming. So that's why I went to the window, which she did. And you have to take a guess of when the dog went to the window. This has been proven statistically significant. The dog went to the window when the woman had answered the phone and decided that she would call a cab to go home because that was the connection of the dog with her. When she had decided to come home, in other words, the dog was saying, she's where she's supposed to be with me, that deep love connection that dogs can demonstrate, and love is one of the most powerful of our human experiences, but, you know, dogs are pretty amazing lovers and, and, and loyal. Uh, so that, to me, if you want to prove for synchronicity, uh, but that's a mind-blowing thing to think that synchronicity could work. So here is, um, this is the carpet here on the, in my room. I finally, after 20, 30 years, uh, demonstrated how to use the Yarrow stock method to consult the Yi Jing. So now we're going to move uh, very particularly into how to use the Yi Jing. So this, the whole realm I developed, and I hope I didn't lose too many of you by that deep dive, but now is the easy part. So this is, the Jing is a profound book of wisdom and I met a Chinese scholar um, and student of the Yi Jing, University of Wisconsin, Madison. And he did not like the fact that I used the Jing as an oracle that discredited it. And many Chinese nowadays, they've really lost connection with this book 
I can talk about that later if somebody wants to ask a question about it. So the Yarrow stock is the most traditional way of consulting the Jing. Most people use coins, but it's much more reflective and meditative. And if you want the details about how to use the Jing, how to use it intelligently, types of questions to propose to the Jing, the frequency of use, that's all in my article. Uh, that's on my website, ecoyoung.com. So let's get into how you use the book. For many of you, uh, this will be uh, pretty mundane. You will know about it. For those of you that haven't used it, think of how uh, you developed a proof in geometry and you could follow the different steps in the proof, but two days later, if you were asked to uh, repeat it, you probably couldn't. So here we go. So the coin method of consulting the gene. Take three pennies, give heads a value of three, tails a value of two. There on the left side, heads, 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 three, three, two. So if you toss those coins out and add them up, there are only six numbers you can get, six, seven, eight, and nine. So if you toss the coins out and got all tails, two, 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 be six. If you got all heads, three, 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 nine some combination of the two in between. So the top line is called the old yin. So let, well, let's start with uh, eight, the young yin. So that's the archetypal kind of feminine, the receptive, dark and moist. But if it gets excessive, then you got the six at the top. Uh, that's it too moist, it's flooding, too dark, it can be scary and so on. Uh, then the seven is your yang line, that solid line. That's the, the yang, it's uh, assertive, outgoing, light bringing, and so on. But if it's excessive, then it's that nine at the bottom. It's so firm, it's rigid. Uh, it's so light, it can be blinding. I call that the Richard Nixon line, and I could probably add another more recent president to in, uh, illustrate that line at the bottom. Uh, it then breaks down and becomes a yang yin. And that's the beauty of the Chinese system. When things get near their excess, they revert to their opposites. So that old yang yin at the top becomes the yang yin, and the old yang at the bottom becomes the yang. Uh, the old yin becomes the yang yang, the old yang becomes the yang yin. So here's uh, Yaro that you use to, to generate your, to uh, create your bundle of 50 sticks for a Yarrow stock method of consulting the Jing. And here's the next step. So, uh, so you've tossed your coins out six times. First time you toss, that's the bottom line. And let's say you generated the numbers eight, seven, nine, seven, six, eight. So you use that code and you convert those numbers to lines and you look it up in the book and you have hexagram 32. Now the changing lines, that nine, which is the third from the bottom and the six, which is the fifth from the bottom, those are called changing because they're old lines and they're gonna change to their opposites. So to get your second hexagram, you change the changing lines, leave the unchanging as they are. So what you have then is that 32 is your present situation, your present hexagram, and 47 is where you're gonna be at some point in the future. Uh, that's where you're headed, but the future is not set. If you get some advice, like in hexagram 32, that you're really heading in the wrong direction, the Jing tells you what you can do to correct that, so 47 is not inevitable. So here's the situation. We've come to the Jing with questions. And what kind of questions can you put to the Jing? Um, relationship questions are great. Um, you can ask questions about your profession. In therapy, you can ask questions about your analysis. Twice in my 38 years as an analyst, I've asked questions about some really difficult situation. And twice I've had my analysis and ask a question as well. And then we looked at our answers. 
In Zurich, I use the I Ching to help decide which of three analysts uh, to work with. Interesting enough, the bottom trigram, which would have been me, uh, was the same, but the top three were different. And I ended up going with the perfect analyst for me, which Dr. Elizabeth Roof. Um, there's one, and, and of course you can use the Jing. I, I think every president should have an e Jing consultant. So here's some of the books that I like to use. Uh, I always start off with Wilhelm because it's, it's so symbolically rich and symbols are your closest access to the abstractness of the num numerical base of the gene. And it's if when you work with dreams, it's very similar to how you work with the I Ching. The answers aren't always that clear. You got to play around with them. It's kind of like kneading dough. You got to work out all the roughs, the, the lumpy spots in the dough to get your answer. So it's very much an interactive process with you and the person you're working with. The second book I go to is the Yi Jing workbook. Uh, excellent. Um, and he breaks the answers down as to whether it's a, about a business question, a uh, issue with a friend or a spiritual issue. And it, at the bottom of each page, describing the whole hexagram is what it means if you get no changing lines. This is the third one I go to. It's the most psychological. This woman has obviously used the Jing an awful lot and incorporates her knowledge into the book. We call a guide to the I Jing. And there's the Taoist I Jing. It, all the answers are given in terms of what the yin and yang energies is doing. And there's that Taoist robe. Here's a, a, a Wang, Master Wang's I Ching. And he, one thing he does, he shows some of these ancient Chinese ideograms to illustrate the answers. And um, that, remember that mandala before that I showed? One thing you could put in there would be King Wen's life. Every, chain, every line in there is described about how King Wen would have dealt with a situation. So here's hexagram one and hexagram two, solid yin and yang, all those attributes we talked about before. Half the commentary in the book on the 64 hexagrams is based on those two. So I'll just illustrate a couple of hexagrams and then move toward a, a conclusion here. Um, so how did the Chinese say what they did about that totally abstract stuff of the solid and broken lines. There were many different ways. For example, the bottom line is associated with something just coming into being or the youngest member of the family. The top line is associated, could be associated with a sage if you're talking about a government situation. Second from the top, the king. Third from the top, the minister and all the way down to the peon. Uh, you could think about family members, the father from the top, mother, and so on going down. Many different associations. So the Chinese could, um, it illustrates the 10,000 things that come out of this basic structure. So, uh, and another last significant thing is when you go from the third line to the fourth, you're going from the, that lower trigram to the upper. And if you think of your chakra system, uh, going from the third chakra to the fourth, the third chakra is kind of like the ego. It's like Adler. The fourth is the heart, its relationship to another person. So you're going in, in, in terms of humans and intimacy, you're going from, from something that uh, is, can be totally sub subjective but to be a human being, you've got to be able to relate to others, hopefully in an intimate manner. And when you get into intimate relationships, that's when all your stuff comes up. So that three to the four is a tricky point. You often get a negative comment on that line in the I Ching. So this one is uh, related to, it's called hexagram 23. And it's uh, related to the winter solstice. 
So the idea is you have the one last yang light line surviving. All the yin lines are moving up from the bottom. Chinese things see things as coming in from the bottom. They're about to overthrow the last yang line. They're about to eliminate consciousness, if you will. The most negative line in the Jing is that fourth line from the bottom. The lines are following the metaphor of a person in bed. So it begins on the lower lines with the leg splitting and so on. And in the fourth line, the occupant of the bed is splitting. That's how the Yi Jing could be describing somebody having a psychosis, schizophrenia, splitting. So a lot of negative uh, uh, associations there. And this is the flip side of that. The yang line is now coming in from the bottom. That's the day after the winter solstice. The light energy is just returning. It's called a turning point. And like-minded people get together, change will come of its own accord. Now, I'm a, I'm a Pink Floyd fan. I saw their original uh, concert in Berkeley in the fall of 1967. And my favorite Pink Floyd album, the only one I still have to listen to on occasion is Guma Guma. But the first album, the preceding one, they sang about something right out of the I Ching. That album was called Pied Piper at the Gates of Dawn. You could think of that as the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Their song, Chapter 24, is a paraphrase of Wilhelm's description of uh, the turning point. Now, here's an interesting trigram. It's called the standstill. Uh, and it's a very negative thing for a book of changes. You have three young lines associated with the masculine intellect spirit. Natural movement is up. The bottom three lines is uh, yin lines associated with earth. Natural movement is down. Heaven and earth are out of relationship to each other standstill. Now, this is one of the most positive, uh, I think, hexagrams in the Jing. And I'd like to think that's what we have to be doing now. This is, I'd like to think, a hexagram for where we are now. It's called increase. And what the Chinese imagine is that that bottom line from that top three has come down to help out the three yin lines below. And this is what Wilhelm says about that. The message of the hexagram, an archetypal image, is that those with power in whatever form come down to help out the less fortunate. Wilhelm says, this conception expresses the fundamental idea of which the book of changes is based. To rule truly is to serve. A sacrifice of the higher element that produces an increase of the lower is called an out-in-out -in -out increase. It indicates the spirit that alone has power to help the world. So this is how I how I see that, what that means in our time. This relates to income inequality, racism, sexism, political and social inequalities, and healthcare inequalities. Also, a major inequality is our species in relationship to all other species. We must realize how unique we are in being able to figure out the laws of nature and bend them to our example, our our benefit. And as a pathologist, I, uh, I have to throw this last one in. If we control diseases, a natural limiting factor, we must consciously limit our human populations. Religions that don't support that have to change. So here is my article. Uh, it appeared in this book, uh, Psyche and Analysis. This was in the Chinese translation of it. There is the English translation that's available on my website. So to summarize everything then, the I Ching goes back 5,000 years to the beginning of one of the oldest cultures, back to Chinese shamanism and the origin of the written Chinese language. Numbers are the purest form of archetypes, and the I Ching is based on the numerical binary code that computers run on. The numerical base framed by the thinking of the great Chinese sages 
as they put images and words to the abstract numbers, beginning with the yin and yang lines. The resulting 64 hexagrams and then 4,096 archetypal statements can be consulted via synchronicity to provide the wisdom of the Chinese sages to our particular issues. So this is my uh, website, Eco Young, that has these articles, plus articles like on, um, no, on, on Jung and Eco Psychology, my blog site, articles on Jung and climate change, George Floyd, COVID, and so on. Uh, Dennis Merritt, if you Google Dennis Merritt, Jarlstock method, this is my demonstration of how to use the uh, Jarlstock method. And then uh, Seasons of the Soul, um, I have to put this up privately, but if you email me, um, I can give you the link. And like I said, that's how you can illustrate those four basic concepts in the I Ching by weather phenomena. And my article, Sacred Landscapes, Sacred Seasons, a Jungian Eco-Psychological Perspective, uses the I Ching and my experience with Native American spirituality to describe how sacred places are created and maintained by applying complexity theory to Jungian thought. And then hexagrams appearing in the dreams of a Western man. You can get that from Chicago for five bucks. There's the link. And then Dorakov sand play therapy. My last comment, you can get this video online. Dorakov developed sand play therapy in the Jungian world. And one of the things she said and illustrated in this video is that the healing with the children she comes with goes down to this contained space. And she claims that all the children would get down to like this earth level in the psyche, element earth as she called it. And that uh, would be that holistic center. And there they would have animals and mandala symbolism. So that's all folks. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have to tell you that the number of people in the program hardly decreased at all since you began. So you didn't- That's amazing. Didn't lose a lot of people. And two donations have come in while you're talking. <laughs> so Ooh. seems uh, that things have gone well. Um, so please people use the raise hand function if you want to ask a question. I don't, you must have questions. There's gotta be questions. I don't see any raised hands right now. There's one. Um, also Dennis, perhaps um, maybe you could send me the PowerPoint and I could then send out to the whole list of people who attended um, any of the links that are in your PowerPoint. Would that be possible? Oh, sure. It's going to be in the, the video that you're going to post anyway, so. Right. So. It might be nice to just send people the links. Sure. And like I said, one of the reasons, I put a lot of time into this, and it's kind of a summary of right. a lot of years in various ways. And it, it was because this can be made permanently available and widespread. It's one of the few hopes I have for a species is the internet, that we can put good things together, and they can be uh, inexpensively and wisely and widely distributed, hopefully wisely distributed as well. Okay, and maybe if you stop sharing, then we can see the people. Better. Yes, thank you. For okay, that. so first we here. have um, David Johnson has a question. Oh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, Dennis, that was great. Anybody who can put uh, Young and Pink Floyd and Sheldrake all in a lecture, I really enjoyed it. Um, but I had a question. Um, I think Jung was familiar with the I Ching around 1920, um, but he kind of only kind of spoke about it kind of in that introduction around 1949. Uh, was there a reason for him to kind of wait publicly to kind of go and, um, you know, promote the I Ching? Um, well, you gave me an opportunity. I mean, there because I didn't look that closely at my notes, a lot of things I could say. Yeah, Jung started using the Jing in about 1919 used it extensively, got so good at it, he could pretty well predict what his clients were going to get. And as a scientist, I thought, oh my God, you could set up an experiment. Uh, but then at one point in his life, he stopped using it so much. And he said he preferred to walk in the dark and see if the waters of the unconscious would support him. So the, what I find with most Americans, we want answers right away. 
And when you can, within five minutes, get an answer by tossing the coins, uh, you can easily abuse the book. So that's why I give advice on not to use it. And, and as to why Jung didn't talk about it that much, uh, you see it in, in his uh, various writings and things. He mentions it often enough. Um, some, one thing I wonder about is like, for example, when he got interested in alchemy, he, uh, Tony Wolf was very concerned that that was really gonna discredit him in the uh, scientific world, the medical world, because he didn't write about synchronicity until 1952. That's nine years before he died. Uh, so I don't know if it took him that long to put everything together, but uh, even in the Jungian world, when I've done Yi Jing workshops and, and talks, I get uh, negative feedback from at least a couple of trainees or analysts say, this doesn't belong in the Jungian world. You know, it discredits us. So, and then you look at the way, um, oh, I forget the guy's name who attacked Jung, uh, but anyway. Thank you. Okay, next we have Hermenia. Hello, thank you. This was really a very wonderful lecture um, or presentation. I have uh, three very short questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, that hit me was when I was looking at the uh, hexagrams and the numbers associated with them. I wondered if there has ever been a Pythagorean reduction of the hexagrams like the 32 into a five and if if so what that might mean and the other um question well, that just i to answer that right away oh, okay uh, i don't know okay. um uh, quite frankly there there there's a there's endless amounts of deep discussions about the jing number symbolism everything one of the translations that i like um and i mentioned and i used that some of the things from, from him is uh, this, this wonderful book. Whoa, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you yes, can see it. Okay, by I me. The author, there are 200 pages in there of diagrams and charts about the deeper levels of the I Ching. So maybe the answer would be in there. Hold but it up I again. Hold it up and keep talking. Hold it up and keep talking so you'll stay in the center and then people will see oh, it. Oh, okay. So. Um, um, the the author is presented today was let's say the author yeah oh me well, hold it up hold it up so we can see the author's name see it keep talking okay so me um and um what i presented today is about as far as i care to go into the really abstract stuff i'm much more interested in using the jing and working with people and and consulting. So that's where most of my contribution can come from. So your next question. Oh, um, when you were talking about the dog, um, I had seen quite a while ago, a documentary on that uh, dogs who, who know that their uh, masters are coming home and what they determined uh, or their hypothesis is that the, the dogs have the scent of the owner still in the house. And as time passes, the scent diminishes. And so at a certain point of diminishment, it triggers in them that the person is coming home. So I don't know, you know, that's the only sure, thing. That can be very easily answered. Um, so uh, uh, that argument would be that that dog would go to the window at a particular time, the diminishment. But the random number generator created random times and the dog went to the window to when the woman had picked up the phone and she decided the connection is is the dog with her psyche not with the random number generator or the phone company and, and but at that moment not when she was riding home or just when she's about to get home but when she decided that she's going to call the taxi in. so that that would uh, disprove that that's when you set up a synchronicity experiment, you have to think of a lot of variables. It's the trickiest experiment I've ever designed, and I'm fairly good at designing experiments. Thank you. And the uh, last one is about the square and the circle. Mm -hmm. um, I've read about the square and the circle. Um, I can't seem to find as much or anything practically about the globe and the cube. 
And uh, so if the globe is within the cube and then the cube begins to um, like pulse or expand the size of the cube, uh, which I assume is like an energy, mm -hmm. uh, what would that mean? I mean, because you have the square and the circle, but then you have the other than three dimensionality, mm -hmm. um, what would it mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've taken the square and the circle to its uh, three-dimensional form, a globe and a cube. So if you're talking about the globe being inside of the cube, that would be that big mandala that I was illustrating. So the cube, the globe would be like the inner king. So when that's pulsating, when your center, yourself, if you will, your personal experience of the self is activated, uh, and that would be when it's pulsating and that's when it would be pushing, would be expanding the cube, which is like our human consciousness. The other way around that you usually hear talked about is squaring the circle. Mm -hmm. So this, if you take the circle as the, the, the wholeness and the original unity, I think of, I think of Plato's idea or the, the Greeks idea of the, uh, the humans like a golden ball there's your sphere. So that bowl, the golden ball comes into life. It's your unique genetic code and everything that implies. But as that you try to manifest that, that can really get bent out of shape by your family of origin and trauma and all that sort of stuff. So then when you, when you get older and you're in therapy, you're trying to go back to, to get in touch with that uh, golden ball. And one way that was presented in fairy tales, for example, was in Iron Hans, mm -hmm. uh, what Robert Bly wrote about when the prince's ball rolled into. So what was bent out of shape in that fairy tale was the male's connection with testosterone energy with sex and aggression, which is really pretty wounded uh, for the males in our Western culture. So and we had, a, we had a lecture on Iron Hans very recently. There you go. So that's one way you can think about that, that would be one manifestation of that, those basic archetypal abstractions. Um, I just want to add something. I, I did try to find things about the globe and the cube. Mm -hmm. And I found a mathematical system that talks about it. And it's called the convex cube. And it's fascinating to read it because it sounds so much like uh, the depths of the unconscious, and the it talks about multi-dimensional streams, and all this other um, information. It's really quite interesting. But I was looking for the psychological. You know, I connected that to the psychological, but I was really looking more for that. So thank you very much. The uh, another good book on the mathematics of the I Ching uh, goes from the Scientific American article. And I was in Arnie Mandel's class when he was in Zurich. He had a, a class of followers and he, and he had something on the I Ching and he commented how many uh, physicists are interested in this book because it really pushes them into another realm. All these mathematical things you were describing, I think we're getting closer. And I'm so excited about complexity theory because it talks about nonlinearity that's why I see Hermes as the god of complexity theory. This is our Western imaginal storyline of what I think is happening with complexity theory. But the book of changes in hexagram two, there, there's one thing you could do is look through the I Ching and, and show uh, the many statements uh, that illustrate complexity theory. Thank you very much. Next, we have Tita. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Actually, Herminia's question, the second question led to my current question. I found the experiment with the dog uh, and the random number generator very interesting. And uh, I, I, I didn't get quite uh, how they were measuring, like what was the um, measuring methodology that they used to determine that the dog went to the window when uh, the, uh, the person had the intention to call the taxi and go home. Sure. Um, they, they filmed the window seat where the dog would go to 24 seven. And they found times it would, it would, it would, it, it wouldn't just go there when the owner was coming home. 
And sometimes there's some female dog was walking outside and that was where scent would come and it would go there. But they, they were able to make the association between when the woman had decided when she got the phone call, which was sent to her by a random number generators to when the call would be made. So they were able to link that up with the video of the dog being at the window seat or not. Okay. And the statistics are presented in the appendix of that book. And there's even a critique by some guy who tries to debunk all sorts of stuff. But then there's a response to the critique. It's pretty convincing to me. Thank you. OK, we have Jonathan called uh, Vierville. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. This is a brilliant presentation. Three things. First, uh, both of my grandfathers were dairy farmers. So I'm oh, going to hey. get your book in, in Ohio. And uh, second thing is also one of my analysts in Zurich was Adolf Allman. Oh, so, yes, Dr. We, Allman. Yes, He's, he was did. on my thesis committee for the I Ching. Yes, yes. And we, we, he did, we did a lot of uh, I Ching to get, anyways. But my, the third, my question really is, how would you relate soul or psyche to this whole phenomena? in terms of how does the soul play out with the I Ching? I mean, it is an oracle and you're oh. looking for, so I, that's just, a, it's an open question, but thank oh, you very much. Pretty easy one to answer. That diagram that I showed of Hermes wand, the Hillmanians really developed the idea, and this is related to complexity theory, that archetypes are not inherited. They are emergent phenomena. Um, so, um, if you think of archetypes as kind of the closest, closest to the essence, just like those number symbolism, binary code for the I Ching, uh, how you get close to your essence, I mentioned the various ways you can do that. Um, and that is that gap in Hermes wand can be done by a near death experience. Um, it can be like an intense love relationship. And the way the Hillmanians talk about it is that when the psyche is moved, that's what generates soul. So soul emerges, you get a sense of your essence by the experience of some intense uh, kind of intimate relationship, near death experience, vision quest, deep meditation, and so on. And what the Jing is doing uh, in terms of soul then, if you think of that deepest level uh, for a man of the mysterious woman, what Jung called level four, the archetype, that's other as the uh, female as the face of God, then what the Jing is doing is that's your personal avenue into that original sense of wholeness. And uh, uh, what I did, the Jing then tries, like when working uh, with deep uh, dreams, like that, uh, uh, what you can get from Chicago, the hexagrams appearing in the dreams of a modern man. Mm -hmm. He came into analysis at that phase to get in touch with his anima at a deeper level, his soul. And six times in the process of doing that, he was, uh, was uh, consulting the I Ching or given hexagrams. So there, would, that would show a demonstration of the link between soul and um, uh, archetype and the I Ching. So the sense of Eros, the Eros, yes. the, the Eros and Psyche. Eros yeah. and Psyche, uh, yeah, uh, but it's not just, uh, it's not just Eros, because if you think of that original wholeness and what humans are to do is to embody that, we have a pretty strong, compared to the rest of the living world, an incredibly strong uh, intellect and brain and spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. So Apollo is one of the gods as well. Uh, it, every god has their own form of eros. It's another way of thinking. And every god has their own form of sexual expression. But we have to think, start thinking more in terms of uh, gestalts and ecosystems and so on. And if you look at the, the Greek pantheon, that's kind of an e ecosystem of the gods in one particular uh, culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with you. I mean, need to talk about dairy farming. 
uh, yeah, read the uh, well, uh, dairy farming. I've I've got to uh, read you this quote from my first volume of the Dairy Farmer's Guide. Uh, I, I want to thank Craig Warner for being the incredible editor. I needed somebody who knew about the I Ching, Native American spirituality, and Jung, and there he was. So I dedicated to my parents, small dairy farmers of a bygone era. We had 25 cows. In my county now, there's a, a farm with 5,000 dairy cows, these capos. It has replaced 200 family farms like I grew up on. And here's the first quote from my first volume by Jung. We keep forgetting that we are primates and that we have to make allowances for these primitive layers in our psyche. The farmer is still closer to these layers. In tilling the earth, he moves around within a very narrow radius, but he moves on his own land. And that's one of the reasons I call it the Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe. This title came to me very early in my work. It took me 18 years to put that those four books. I thought it was going to be one together. And it wasn't until I finished that I realized that um, that it was growing up on that farm and the difficulties that I had in the seventh grade after my one room country school closed down, my dad was bipolar, no spiritual background, that I, I couldn't get to sleep and I started my search. So everything I've been doing then is a response to that, but it's out of that connection with the animals and cows especially, but also I love pigs and chickens. Uh, but also the, the land and the insects and the birds. And I forgot to mention my personal soul image that got me started on Jung and Eco Psychology. One of the many big dreams I had in my last year of training was single image dream, typical Wisconsin meadow or pasture scene. But every atom in that had an inner light. It was a sacred landscape. And I've seen the Swiss Alps, Canadian Alps, California coastline, Oregon, but I've never seen anything as beautiful as that typical. That's one of the reasons we came back to Wisconsin when I finished in Zurich. So when I go to Atwater Beach where I exercise, I'm gonna do a documentary on that to illustrate this point. When I go there, I remind myself that if my soul looked like a landscape, this is what it would look like. So then you look at everything in that landscape very carefully. But because it's beside Lake Michigan, that's changing all the time, the book of changes. So the sense of a soul is not some uh, a static thing. It's like those dragons in, on that Taoist coat, uh, coat. So you fully embrace the moment. That's what the Jing is helping you do. And to fully get into the moment and to embody the moment, that soul, that's how it's created. Good. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of people with raised hands. So I'm hoping, Dennis, maybe you'd be able to stay on a little bit past six so we can try to reach everybody. OK. Uh, so next, we have Virginia Barrett. Hello, Dennis. Hello. Uh, what a fascinating subject. Um, I had just one more question about uh, the dog experiment, because uh, what came to my mind was um, uh, mental telepathy between the dog and the person mm -hmm. that she made when she made her decision that's when the dog took action and I've had the same experience with my cat I sit there and say where did that cat go I haven't seen her in the last hour within five minutes the cat will show up and look up at me and say uh, here I am <laughs> So I'm just wondering, uh, what, what do you think is the connection between mental telepathy and synchronicity? That would be another way of describing it. Yeah, it's, it's a causal. We still don't know how to describe that. There have been a lot of experiments, but yeah, that would, psychokinesis, all that kind of stuff. Those are different names for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and. So I designed my synchronicity experiment with human beings. But then when I heard about these dog experiments and these, those cat kind of things that you described, it's like, duh, these animals have such deep and powerful connections with us 
that if you want to test something about synchronicity and mental telepathy or whatever, a lot easier to do with a dog and a human than a human and a human. Yeah. But I appreciate your connection with your cat. Yeah, I think love is is a, is a connective of some sort. It's like a mental internet or something. Oh yeah, I mean we've now studied uh, what's what's happened, what chemicals are released in the brains of dogs and cats when they're connected with human beings. Are the same kind of brains, like in women, especially it's oxytocin. Oxytocin, and growing up on a dairy farm, you know that. The cow has to be comfortable to so-called let her milk down so you can milk the cow. That's oxytocin that causes that to be released. And that's what happens when a mother is nursing the baby. So it's kind of the connection hormone. But science is getting really sophisticated in, in being able to study these things at deep levels. Thank you. Mary Francos. I, I have two questions. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your um, talk. You have bring, bringing knowledge from so many different um, cultures and times. And thank you, it's very deep. Thank you oh, thank very you. much. Um, as regards the I Ching, um, when, when um, people ask me, I, I've worked with it for a number of years. When people ask me about it, my, my kind of cooked answer is that for me, it's like praying. Um, and the other thing is that it, it basically always says behave well. He's always talking about the sage, always behave well. Um, and then I have one more question. Do you, do you have a response to that? Should I clean up my response some way? Um, the, the advice I give for people consulting the Jing is that it should be a really important question, something you've wrestled with a long time. And before you consult the Jing, uh, think, uh, I, like to, uh, I like to face north. There are many different ritualistic things you do. You wanna get in a receptive space. And hexagram four describes that. It's like the pupil in relationship to a master. And so you want to have respect for what you're doing. Um, it's like the way I describe it, it's like I think of it as the ultimate self-help book. It's like consulting a kindly old uncle or a Chinese sage or young in his, his elderly years. It's with humility and respect and openness. Um, and whatever you can do to get into that space, there are two generally suggested ways of doing it. One is while you're casting the hexagram to be in that open receptive space or to be thinking about your question the whole time. And to me, using the yarrow stock helps draw or out that meditative space a lot more than using the coins. And I like to say, if you don't have 15 minutes to spend doing the yarrow stock method, you shouldn't be asking the question. You're too anxious, uh, you haven't, uh, dealt with the issue long enough and so on. So um, again, uh, Wilhelm's description under the judgment uh, tells you what attitude to have in consulting the Jing. Was there some other part to your question that I missed? Um, well, the second part I was going to ask you has to do with synchronicity. Um, it seems like synchronicities tend to happen in clusters. There will be a short period of time where they, 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 uh, numerous ones happen mm -hmm. close in time. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, that's uh, that's something I had to consider in my thesis. I forget the the number there. There are things about uh, numbers and statistics about those kind of things. And in terms of synchronicities happening in a short period of time, really uh, you're talking about archetypal constellations. So when something really archetypal and powerful is happening, there are more synchronistic things happening around you, like around births and deaths and so on. And even deep meditation, my analyst told me um, how she was meditating one time and the, the arms fell off of her clock. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, um, and, and, and as an aside, 
uh, C.A. Meyer read my thesis and uh, he told me that Wolfgang Pauli was interested in synchronicity and the theory of evolution. So I thought, oh, I'm in good company. But he didn't think my experiment could work because we, uh, synchronicity is supposed to be a causal. But he said, when you're consulting the Jing, you're kind of causing a synchronicity to happen so my experiment could work. So I went over to see him and gave me an hour to talk about my thesis. We stood in the doorway to his office and there was this back and forth for about five minutes and that was it. Uh, so we, I think, agreed to disagree. But for me, as scientists, just run the darn experiment. You don't have to argue them any teeth are in a horse's mouth. But it is unusual. You are calling forth, but it's like Hermes calling forth something. But it's only if you're in the right frame of mind. That receptive line is like, uh, it reminds me, so there's another album I have to play on occasion, and I also wrote about this in my master's thesis, it's an almost state, Bob Dylan's Highway 61 Revisited. It's like when you get to that state in the ballad of a thin man where Dylan's saying, something's happening here, but you don't know what it is. Yes. Do you, Mr. Jones? Yes. Yes. So that, those are the moments when you want to go to the gym. Like uh, Leonard Cohen saying, that's how the light gets in. Something has to crack in that stable form. Uh, that's when the, the, the uh, Maria Prophetisa, that's at uh, step three when, oh my God, things, things have to fall apart so something new can come in when that going back to the original source, the self, as it connected to the broader universe. We have, the Jing will help you think about we're, we're connected not only to nature, but we're living out of the same binary codes as uh, organisms, and the rest of the universe are. That's what Jung meant about these deeper levels. He talked about consciousness down to the level of the amoeba, and he wasn't kidding. And after one of his near-death experiences, he thought he was a fish. And when they were feeding him soup, he was concerned that the soup would be falling through his gills. So that's what he meant about those deeper levels of the unconscious. And my talk on that, if you Google eco-psychology voices in my lecture, I went into the different layers of the collective unconscious. Just another real quick question. Um, um, you know what? No, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. We've got sorry. a lot of people. In fact, sorry. I'm going to ask everybody to limit yourself to just one question going forward because I have a lot of raised hands. Uh, Carolyn Spargo. Right. Hi. Thank you um, for the presentation. Very interesting. My question is more of a hands-on uh, use of the I Ching. Mm -hmm. I've always used um, the coins in the past, but I'm I would really love to be able to use the arrow stocks, but how does one go about, like, do we grow them, harvest them? How does one uh, get a hold of some arrow stocks? Wonderful question. Um, I, when I do the, my I Ching workshops, I always make sure I have a supply on hand. A uh, dear friend of mine has some land in the unglaciated part of Wisconsin, beautiful area. And uh, she tells me when there's a good yar yarrow harvest on her land. So I go out there and I collect it and I create my own bundles. But otherwise you can go online and there are various places that sell yarrow. I think I even found one that uh, ships it in from uh, China, but I don't know how that gets past our agriculture bureaus. So you can buy it. And uh, I have the demonstration of the yarrow stock method uh, and the uh, exact description, oh my God, I, I got to make sure that that is posted. The exact description of what is demonstrated in there should be on my uh, uh, website, ecoyoung.com. Okay, thank you. It's kind of complex, but practice it a bit. Uh, you can pause the video and look but hopefully you'll be able to do it. It's a lot easier to see it done than try to read it out of a book. Because if you're like me, and it says with your right hand, pick up the right bundle and put it in your left hand, it's like, where's my right hand, so. <laughs> okay, next is Shahrazad Shashani. Hey, Dr. Merritt. Uh, just want to really appreciate your presentation. It oh, was brilliant. You. 
uh, you know, I've been uh, consulting the I Ching for a couple of decades, but the way you described the lines, it kind of made, gave me a heartfelt feeling about the whole lines. I started loving them. So that's something that happened to me. I had a couple of questions. I won't ask them, and I'm going to ask you an unrelated question to your talk. Maybe you can guide me later on. And that is your expertise, your work with the insects and my fascination with the spiders. I know they're not insects, they're arachnids connected to anthropods, but uh, psychologically and spiritually, have you done any work on that and have you written about it? Uh, I've been working on it a lot and I'd love to know what you have made out of it. Oh, yes. Uh, I, this wasn't a plant. Thank you for asking me. My volume four, Land, Weather, Seasons, Insects, and Archetypal View. All right. So the, the last chapter of my last of the four volumes is called Planet of the Insects. And I drew a lot upon Hillman and the way he talked about insects. Wonderful stuff. I summarize. My books are in many ways kind of like a reader's digest. I just brought together stuff that a lot of different people have done. So I've summarized about uh, 15 or 16 books and probably 30 or 40 articles. But so what Hillman said about that is in there. In my very last thing for Pink Floyd fans, the very last thing I wrote is called, well, there's praying mantis as a spirit animal, second last thing, but Appendix D, Pink Floyd and the Fly and Life's Ointment. So I took uh, the two cuts off the Uma Guma album, Grant Chester Meadows, and several little furry creatures grooving together with a pick in a cave. And the, uh, the, the sounds that Pink Floyd put at the beginning of Grant Chester and at the end, I uh, used to illustrate Hillman's extermination complex when it comes to insects. So that's where you can tie in Pink Floyd, Hillman, insects. Hillman said insects have figured out something basic about the cosmos. They are the most successful life forms on the planet. Two thirds of the species are insects. Um, and each insect probably represents a quarter million years of evolution. And the and what me as an entomologist, one of the things that makes me most anxious about climate change and loss of biodiversity is the Europeans are discovering that insect populations are down by a quarter. And the reptiles and the birds and all sorts of things feed on them. And to me, this is one of the most disturbing uh, indications that we as humans are really screwing our planet up. And we've got to get going on that. So I write about that in, um, um, in, in some of my articles that'll be on my blog site. Oh, so it's land, weather, land, weather. What was the name of land, your Land, weather, seasons, insects. An archetypal insects. view. Insects. Yeah, Hillman, okay. uh, when I got to Zurich, Hillman wanted me to do a, my thesis on it. insects. But I was trying to get away from entomology and I, I came up with something else. But no, I, I've talked just about as many ideas I have about in, insects and the psychological level. It's in that book. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you a lot. So we have I, I will find you. Four, four raised hands left. Hopefully we can get through all four, but we won't take any after. So no new raised hands, I'm sorry. Next we have Corinna Maslanka. Hi. Um, Hmm. Excuse me, I was wondering if you could speak at all to any connections um, to the Jungian Tarot. To the what? The Jungian Tarot. The Tarot? Yes. Uh, uh, well, yeah, one of my um, analyses is really into the Tarot. And uh, he sees a lot of links to that and the uh, Kabbalah, mm -hmm. but he also uses the Jing, and uh, we're doing some deep, deep dream work. So yeah, that's a very powerful symbol system. He's shown me some of the cards, 
it's really symbolically loaded. Uh, 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 what, if you're training to be an analyst, they recommend that you have at least one symbol system. And I was told when I was working on my master's to define one system and really get into it deeply. So my symbol system is the Yi Jing. And I don't know enough about the tarot, but archetypally, I, I know that they're linked, but I haven't studied it that much. But um, there are some, um, I'm sure there's some good books on there on Jung and the tarot. Yeah, but okay, it's not my area of expertise. Okay, thank you. Oh, whoops, I forgot to unmute the next person. Barbara Anderson, I just sent you a message to unmute. Okay, there you go. Thank you, thank you so much. I just wondered if you know or have seen or read Carol Anthony and Hannah Moog's I Ching, um, the um, Oracle of the Cosmic Way. Uh, no, I, I haven't. Um, there are the so many Jing books out there, uh, but uh, I really respect her work. And she yeah. clearly is able to illustrate her comments on the Jing from uh, intensive use of the book with a lot of people. And it's one reason I like to use her third edition. But I did work with somebody years ago who was using that book, and she had some way of being able to extend your questioning to the Jing. But quite yes. frankly, by the I, whenever I consult the Jing, I work with those three uh, main translations. And by the time I get done with that, I'm pretty beat. So uh, <laughs> yes. uh, I do have a collection of, uh, of Yi Jing books, and I'll, I'll show you here. But... Uh, there's my, can you see my, my shelf? And um, uh, I, I collect them, uh, but I, of course I haven't read most of them, but there are, besides those three, if it's really difficult and I need um, some other input, I may use as many as five translations, but I must confess that twice in my many years of using the Jing, I couldn't find any metaphoric base for the answer. But when I looked at the back of Wilhelm, where he talks about why the Chinese said about the things they did, the structural uh, interpretation, mm -hmm. it was looking at that level, going down to the most basic archetypal level with the yin and the yang, which are related to the numbers. That's where I was able to get to a metaphoric base. Okay. But find a translation. And one thing I wanted to say as well is I'm always astonished when I talk to just about every Chinese person that I met and they do not use the Jing, they're not familiar with it, their grandmother yeah. used it, very mysterious. Uh, yeah. there, there are various reasons for that. Um, I think the Jing is probably more available to us here in the West because we have so many good translations. Yeah, thank you. And next we have Cynthia Cavalli who actually once gave a lecture on synchronicity to our club. <laughs> I, I'm not Cynthia, but oh, uh, it's not Cynthia. It's <laughs> Cynthia but, comes uh, here. It's just me here. It's my husband. But I, but I also have given lots of lectures. It's Tom year. Cavalli. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. And yes, uh, Tom has given us lectures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Really great stuff. Uh, my, my question has to do with uh, the collective use of the I Ching, um, from everything from the uh, computer generated um, I Ching online, which is probably as the opposite as you can get from Yarrow sticks, to the predicted, could the COVID uh, pandemic been predicted using the I Ching? And if so, can we use it to see its secession? <laughs> uh, that, that I, uh, I don't, uh... I don't, I don't know about, uh, one could probably ask about the pandemic and the effect on our culture in terms of prediction. Uh, that I've, that, 
I don't know. I, I because of my scientific mind, I like to have pretty distinct um, uh, framing to my questions. Uh, the Jing, however, was used to consult the emperors, and uh, I, I read once or heard once that it's one reason the book was never burned because the emperors needed the advice from the Jing. The Japanese, some Japanese claim that's why they, they lost World War II because they start, stopped using the Jing in war college. Um, so it can be used at the governmental levels. Like I said before, I think every American president should have a Yi Jing uh, consultant. What I do in terms of the more collective, when I do the Jing workshops, uh, I show people that I use the Arlstock method. We learn it as a group. And then we generate a hexagram as a group. And when you're working with a group, especially with some coherency, I remember I did a Jing workshop with a training group in Tennessee years ago. And uh, the Jing uh, kind of brought to the surface some of the underlying dynamics of the group where there were some difficulties they had been wrestling with. So it can be definitely used in more corporate and organizational levels. Mm. Have you ever used the one online, the uh, computer-generated one? No, I never would. I've never used anything but Yarrowstock methods. And that reminds me as well, um, uh, the, the Jing can give you some sense of ultimate freedom. I mean, it's astonishing when you think of it, the implications of this book working. Like I said, one of my friends in Zurich said I was trying to prove the existence of God with that experiment. Uh, but what are the implications of being able to, uh, to be able to get a meaningful answer out of a book to an important issue in your psyche, an intrapsychic connection? But it's just like that dog in the connection with the, the owners. What kind of worldview is that? Physics is, they're, they're, they're talking about many different ways. And woman earlier had some dis mathematical descriptions of stuff but uh hi barbara but uh we uh you know the the experience of it is is i, I think it, it's been demonstrated that synchronicity works this up to the scientists and the mathematicians and how to come up with some explanations of the data thank okay. you last question is uh tanya hurst oh hi um, so I, I also do a workshop called Synchronicity and the Ancient Art of Yi Ching. And I learned uh, how to cast with coins about 30 years ago from my counselor of yore. And I was fascinated. I wanted to say I was fascinated um, by what you said about the gap in Hermes wand. Um, and then I wanted to say something about synchronicities that happen in a cluster. Um, my mentor had shared with me, his, it's Russell Lockhart had shared with me not to take the synchronicities as one-offs, but to try and reflect on what they have in common. And so I spent some time doing that in 2017 with a cluster of synchronicities and basically was led to an initiation by, by being able to reflect on all of them. But my question is, um, you said something about the archetypal experiences, the archetypes as not being imprints, but as being emerging. And I, in my workshop that I do, and of course, I consider myself a layman even after the, all these years, um, I talk about Jung when he mentions the... Um, the ritual dance of the bees and the birds building the nest and the defense mechanisms of the octopus. And so now I'm intrigued about your emergence, um, what you said about emergence and the archetypes and maybe it's in your book and you've already given me a reference, but have you written about that? Is there a place you can point me to? Uh, of course. Um... I go through that in uh, volume one, and then again, particularly in volume three, uh, where I posit Hermes as the god of synchronicity, and I think I illustrate that, that very well. 
So those will be the two things. Volume one and three of your the book that a you mentioned. The Farmer's the... Guide to the Universe. Volume one is called A Jung and Eco Psychology, and volume three is called Hermes Eco Psychology and Complexity Theory. Okay. Thank you so much. And I've just really enjoyed this. Well, thank you. So, Judy, maybe I could close with one yes, of the powerful synchronicities so. I've had in my life. 106 people have hung into the end here. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, uh, so, synchronicities happen more around archetypal events. Uh, no archetypal events are bigger than birth and death. Um, so, this is something that happened to me after my mother's death. Uh, neither one of my parents were churchgoers. So after my mother died, um, we had a gathering and I delivered the eulogy. And then it was a cold January day uh, up in Northern Wisconsin. And we went out, uh, just a few people went out to the graveyard. And after everybody had left, I was standing in front of my mother's casket uh, you know, before it's going to be lowered into the ground. And you know, there, there were all these sprays of flowers on top of the casket. And the big one in the middle was something that was uh, donated by a great school friend of mine from that one room country school who had a flower business. And it had a, on one of the stems, it had a ribbon that said, mother. And when my father had died some years earlier, she had sent a spray of flowers and it had a ribbon that said father. And I had saved the father ribbon and put it in a box and symbolically important to me. But for some reason, when I was looking at the casket and those flowers and that bouquet, I decided that I wasn't gonna take the mother ribbon or the flower. And I swear to God, I took one step toward the car and a flower fell out of the bouquet to my feet and you know what was on it. Yeah. So of course, I saved the ribbon and I put it next to the father ribbon in my box. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. Well, thank you, Judy, for offering me a chance to talk about something I dearly love, the aging. Well, thank you so much. I, mean, I think I mentioned to you, one of our board members, Sherelle Charlie, and we need to thank her. She'd been wanting us to have a talk on the I Ching for a long time. For some reason, I hadn't been able to find a Jungian and I stumbled across you having this area of expertise that we didn't know about. So it was a wonderful, wonderful falling upon you. And um, thank you and uh, thank, thank everybody for staying, hanging in there all this time. And we hope to see you all again at um, our next lecture in uh, March on dreams. I'll say a farewell to an old friend I see on the screen, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Everybody's muted, so we can just wave. Okay, bye everybody.